Salve. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Tocca a me oggi il gradito compito di accogliervi eh, qui nell'auditorium del Centro Internazionale Loris Malaguzzi per questo incontro, questa conversazione con il professor Michel Resnick che prenderà spunto, prenderà avvio dalla sua ultima pubblicazione Lifelong Kindergarten, Cultivating Creativity Through Projects, Passion, Fears and Play. Mm, un caloroso saluto eh, alle autorità presenti, ai referenti dell'amministrazione comunale che ringraziamo per la collaborazione e a tutti voi che ci avete raggiunto da Reggio Emilia ma anche da tante altre città d'Italia. Abbiamo guardato un po' quando le vostre iscrizioni ed effettivamente eh, c'è anche chi arriva da molto lontano e di questo vi ringraziamo. Io mi chiamo Barbara Donnici, sono il coordinatore dell'area progetti della Fondazione Reggio Children Centro Loris Malaguzzi e eh, oggi appunto eh, vi do qui il benvenuto a nome della Presidente della, e di tutta la Fondazione e di tutte le organizzazioni che eh, sostengono e promuovono l'evento di oggi. Questo incontro eh, non avviene in un momento qualsiasi, infatti eh, nei giorni scorsi, come soprattutto i reggiani sanno, si sono svolte diverse iniziative in città in occasione del compleanno di Loris Malaguzzi, nato il 23 febbraio 1920. Ci sono stati momenti di studio e approfondimento con il Reggio Children International Network, con i gruppi di studio qui al Centro Internazionale Malaguzzi, dei momenti di forte partecipazione come la consulta di insediamento dei consigli infanzia città, il coinvolgimento delle scuole ma anche delle case, delle famiglie a Reggio Emilia, fuori da Reggio Emilia, per eh, la vigilia e poi per la notte dei racconti. Eh, ci sono state iniziative, iniziative pubbliche, momenti pubblici. Sabato eh, scorso ci siamo incontrati per presentare il progetto di cui anche brevemente vi parlo oggi e, eh, e ieri in tanti eravamo qui al centro internazionale per l'iniziativa Bambini al Centro con eh, gli atelier e le attività in corso per le famiglie e i bambini. Quindi, come si diceva, eh, e sono dei, dei momenti di, di, di festa, di festa di festeggiamo un compleanno, una nascita e l'idea di una nascita, della nascita e questo eh, e ci piace farlo con degli amici eh, degli amici che eh, come voi vengono eh, come si diceva da Reggio da tante parti d'Italia ma vengono anche da molto lontano e, mh, vengono da eh, alcune organizzazioni internazionali che eh, si occupano di ricerca a livello internazionale appunto e, e che vorrei salutare e sono eh, appunto il Lifelong Kindergarten del MIT Media Lab di Boston con il professor Resnick e Carmelo Presicce, il Tinkering Studio dell'Exploratorium di San Francisco con Karen Wilkinson, Mike Petrich e Luigi Anzivino, li, li sto cercando tra il pubblico, fate... <ride> E il Lego Idea Studio della Lego Foundation con Emos Blanton e Liam Nielsen. Grazie di essere con noi eh, oggi. Siamo, siamo stati insieme in questi giorni, ci siamo incontrati per continuare a eh, ragionare, sviluppare una ricerca che eh, si intitola, state guardando qui eh, alcune delle immagini eh, di sabato scorso quando c'è stato appunto un evento di presentazione alla città del progetto, il progetto TIDA. Eh, tinkering in the Digital Age. Si tratta di una ricerca che oltre ai partner internazionali eh, coinvolge anche ehm, dei, dei partner importantissimi a livello locale che vorrei qui ricordare e salutare perché anche loro sono tra il pubblico. E, mh, quindi parliamo dell'istituzione Scuole Nidi di Infanzia del Comune di Reggio Emilia in particolare due scuole dell'infanzia comunali, la scuola Robinson e la scuola Girotondo. L'istituto comprensivo Galileo Galilei di Reggio Emilia con la scuola primaria al centro internazionale, Reggio Children SRL con gli atelier cittadini del centro internazionale Malaguzzi e officina educativa con lo spazio culturale orologio. In questa ricerca, con questi eh, partner eh, locali e internazionali, stiamo indagando eh, se e in che modo 
ehm, cambiano eh, o sono cambiati i modi di apprendere l'apprendimento, eh, oggi che le tecnologie ci, ci danno molte possibilità in più. E naturalmente abbiamo eh, colto l'occasione di avere a Reggio Emilia questi partner e eh, in particolare eh, a questo punto il um, lifelong kindergarten del, dell'MIT e del Meet Media Lab mh, per eh, chiedere al professor Resnick <ride> di ehm, eh, incontrarsi con noi e di eh, avviare mh, insieme una una conversazione intorno ai temi della creatività. Questo incontro sarà diviso in due parti. C'è un momento, diciamo così, di prima presentazione, che abbiamo chiesto al professor Resnick, diciamo, di introduzione, e poi eh, l'idea è eh, che sia una conversazione, per questo eh, lo abbiamo proprio intitolato così, una conversazione con. E, e la conversazione avviene... Ehm, un po' diciamo, abbiamo chiesto alla nostra Presidente Carla Rinaldi di fare da eh, rompighiaccio, no? di rompere il ghiaccio e di eh, iniziare eh, a porre qualche domanda al Professor Resnick, ma soprattutto vorremmo che foste voi a, eh, a conversare con lui, con noi. Quindi eh, vi chiediamo di riflettere anche su, su quello che ascoltate, ma io sono sicura che tanti sono venuti già eh, pensando <ride> a, eh, alla, a questa possibilità e quindi con, con delle domande, con delle curiosità, eh, per cui la seconda parte dell'incontro, quella un po' più lunga, sarà dedicata proprio a questo, quindi direi che abbiamo un'opportunità unica. Eh, volevo, eh, anche se... Eh, Naturalmente mh, molti, di voi, eh, scusate, molti di voi conoscono il professor Resnick, eh, volevo raccontarvi molto brevemente due cose su di lui e, e poi lasciare, lasciare a lui la parola. E, mh, il professor Resnick è esperto in tecnologie dell'educazione e professore di ricerca de sull'apprendimento del, eh, del MIT Media Lab ha lavorato per, eh, per, per 30 anni con eh, la compagnia Lego, in particolare sviluppando progetti innovativi come i kit robotici del Lego Mindstorms e, e, e insegna eh, grazie a una cattedra eh, sponsorizzata dalla, dalla Lego. Conduce il team, inoltre, che sta sviluppando il software di programmazione la community online Scratch, e, ed è cofondatore del progetto Computer Clubhouse, è un network di eh, centri dopo scuola per eh, ragazzi, per giovani provenienti da eh, comunità eh, svantaggiate. Quindi io adesso do, eh, ho il piacere e l'onore grandissimo di dare la parola al professor Resnick, eh, che chiedo, a cui chiedo di accomodarsi qui insieme alla Presidente Carla Rinaldi. Grazie a tutti. It's really wonderful to be here in Reggio and with Carla because I've had so many great interactions with people here in Reggio and with Carla over the years. So I've been talking for the last few months about the book that I published a few months ago, but this is a very special event. It's different than my other presentations, I think because of the very special connection that I feel here in Reggio. So, I'm not going to give a very long presentation. Uh, I decided I'm just going to give a short introduction, maybe you know, five to 10 minutes, and then move into the conversation with Carla and then with you. And because of this special opportunity here in Reggio, I'm going to focus my opening remarks about my interactions with Reggio and with Carla. And in preparation for the event, I thought back and I realized that it's been about 20 years that I've been making connection with Carla and with Reggio. We first met in 1997. We were both on an advisory group for the Lego, at the Lego company, it was called the Next Generation Forum. Oh, yes. And we were exploring different approaches. And the same way that Reggio has a very special connection, has been a great inspiration for me, the Lego company has as well. Because I think with my work, I've always been, uh, I've always seen that 
the, many of the best learning experiences happen when children are involved in making and playing, when they're creating things in a playful way. So I had a connection with the Lego company because the traditional Lego brick is a great way of making things in a playful way. So we were meeting there. It was right around the time that the Lego company was about to introduce its first robotics kit. It was called Lego Mindstorms. It, our group at MIT had worked with them. And it was extending the Lego idea of making and playing into the digital age. Uh, whereas with traditional Lego bricks, children would build houses and castles. With these new programmable Lego bricks, children could make things that move and interact. And we started to see, you know, around the world, we started testing it, of children building things with Lego, but then adding programmable bricks so it could interact and sense and communicate. And we saw great opportunities with that. Um, and most of the work that I was doing was with children maybe ages 8 to, you know, to 16. I was not doing very much with preschool or kindergarten. So you might wonder, why would I make a connection with Carla? Where we were at these meetings, and she was sharing a lot of her experiences with, pre, with the preschools and the kindergartens here in Reggio. But I felt an immediate connection, because I think there was a, a, a collection of shared values. And in talking with Carla, it helped me recognize that what was special about kindergartens in, ge kindergarten in general and the preschools and kindergartens of Reggio in particular really resonated and connected with what I was trying to work on also. Actually, it was that same year in 1997, there was a book that came out called Inventing Kindergarten that told the history of kindergarten. And when I read that, I was also inspired. Uh, because it told about the first kindergartens being invented about 200 years ago. I just looked on the map this morning. It was about 1,000 kilometers from here. Exactly 1,000 kilometers from Reggio was the very first kindergarten in 1837. And I was inspired by the idea that Kindergartens were not just a school for younger children, but a new way of thinking about learning and education. And I started to you know, recognize something very special about kindergarten and the way that kindergartens had been set up to move away from the approach to education, which was about delivering information or transmitting information, and to focus much more on children learning through experimenting and exploring and expressing themselves. And that connected with my values because I wanted to see children grow up in a world where they were able to learn through their own explorations and their own expressions. So the ideas from kindergarten felt something very special to me. And I was lucky enough that as we got to meet through that, that advisory group, Carla invited me to come visit here. And my first visit was in 1999. Uh, so next year will be the 20th anniversary of my first <laughs> visit to Reggio. So we'll have another celebration next year. This year. Good. <laughs> Uh, and it happened, when I came, again, I was very inspired. We went and visited some of the schools. And again, this idea of children learning through, you know, playfully making things was something I saw throughout Reggio. And I, would, I loved going in to the schools and seeing children, you know, you know, building sculptures with modeling clay and building towers with blocks and building mobiles out of leaves and sticks. Uh, and you know, making pictures with, with crayons and markers. Children were always making things and then sharing what they were making, reflecting on their making. Um, so I saw it as this place that was really resonating with, my, with what I saw was very special about learning. And it happened, it was at a time there was also a very special project going on when I visited in 1999. Uh, that there was a, a kindergarten here was working on designing the curtains for the opera house in Reggio. And the teachers at the school were sharing the project with me and telling me about the project. Actually, I just took this picture 10 minutes ago because the, the curtain is <laughs> hanging down the hall. Uh, so I just took the picture, I saw it there. But when I, I was there in the middle of the year while the children were working on this, and you know, a few things really struck me about it. It's not so often that you go into a kindergarten and see children work on a project that's lasting all year long. And it's not so often that you go in and see children work on a project that has meaning to their, the community that they're living in. Uh, so there's something very special about this project, and I was really inspired you know, talking to the children and the teacher and to the others uh, from Reggio Children Foundation about 
you know, the, what was happening. And I think one reason that it resonated so much with me is that it connected to a whole range of ideas that I saw were important in all learning experiences or the best learning experiences. Over time, I've come to define the, the parts of the learning experience that I see are so important through four words. They're actually the subtitle of this book, Projects, Passion, Peers, and Play. And as I thought about that project uh, with the curtains at the Opera House, I saw that that's what that project was about. The children were not just, they weren't being given a problem to solve in one day and move on to a next problem the next day, or it wasn't just an activity for 45 minutes. This was a project that they're working on where they started ex exploring, coming up with ideas, sharing ideas, developing the ideas, continually iterating and refining those ideas over time. And that's what the project is about. And for me, working on projects like that is how you develop as a creative thinker. So I saw those children developing their creative capacities. Uh, so they were working on projects, and it was projects based on their passion. And you could see their passion. They saw it was something that was important for their community, and they cared about their community. Also, it was explained that the, the curtain, they ended up deciding to do things about plants and bugs, partly because when they visited the opera house, they really were interested in the plants that were growing around it. It was something that they connected to. And there'd recently been a movie that came out called A Bug's Life, and they liked that movie. So it was even popular culture was part of their passion. So they were interested in bugs and plants. And the teachers embraced that interest and said, well, let's do something around bugs and plants and connected with the idea of transformation. And they were talking about how seeds transform into plants uh, and how caterpillars transform into butterflies. And that idea of transformation I, continues here. I saw that in the atelier the other day, continued explorations on transformations. So again, it was children following their passions. And they were doing it with their peers. It was not children working by themselves. A project like that requires groups of children. And I saw the children negotiating with each other, working together on this project. And there were different teams of children and sharing ideas with one another. And we know that learning is not just an individual pursuit. And I could see in this project how children were learning with their peers and from their peers. And then the fourth P of play. I think sometimes people misinterpret play. When they think of play, they think it's just about laughter and having fun. And again, there's nothing wrong with laughter and having fun. But for me, play is about experimenting and trying new things and taking risks and testing the boundaries. And I could see the children doing this. This was something very new to them, and they needed to experiment. And again, through the wonderful documentation that you see in Reggio, I was able to see their whole process and all of the things they tried that didn't work out and all the dead ends that they came back from and, and, and made adjustments and revisions. And for me, that's a playful approach. And I could see it, again, the documentation helped show the process they went through. It was a playful process of experimenting and trying new things. So I came back, I came away so inspired from that you know, visit to Reggio. Um, and I think it really helped you know, inspire me to think more about kindergarten and to see how could that influence all of the work that we do. And that actually led me to come up with the name for my research group, Lifelong Kindergarten came from you know, visits to Reggio and thinking more about kindergarten, was I saw that I wanted to take those ideas from kindergarten and extend it for the whole lifetime. Uh, that for me, it shouldn't just be when you're five years old. Uh, it should be something you continue to learn through projects, passion, peers, and play throughout your whole lifetime. Uh, and in many ways, that's what I've dedicated my career and my life to, is to see how can we take these kindergarten ideas and extend them through a lifetime. So as I've developed new technologies like the Lego Mindstorms or our Scratch programming software, which we'll talk about more later, it was inspired by kindergarten. How can we take that kindergarten idea and let children of all ages and also adults be able to continue to learn in a kindergarten style as they go get older? Or as we create new spaces, like our computer clubhouse after school spaces that I'll say more about later, you know, that how can we create spaces that share that spirit of kindergarten, even as for older children? So that's really been a guiding vision for me, 
you know, since the visit here 20 years ago. And largely what I've written about in this book is about building on that vision of how can we take the ideas of kindergarten and, and spread them through a lifetime. So maybe with that, I'll open up. Oh. And I've had so many uh, wonderful and provocative conversations with Carla over the years, so I look forward to sharing more ideas now. Thank you very much. And uh, especially I think, uh, I hope that we are able to involve more and more our audience uh, that are anyway, not only audience, but probably, oh, scusate, ho oh, dimenticato. No, 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 scusate. <laughs> no, <laughs> scusate. Eh, eh, ma probabilmente non solo, molti di loro sono stati con te partner in ricerche, scambi e approfondimenti. Quindi grazie per aver ricordato l'origine della tua amicizia con questa città, ma soprattutto su, su questa idea ancora oggi purtroppo più che mai allora innovativa questo sguardo nuovo su un'infanzia che credo eh, abbia, ci abbia accomunato in tutti questi anni. Ecco, allora per continuare su questa intimità di, di storie, ma nello stesso tempo rompendo il confine del pubblico e del privato, una volta ci siamo detti che ci sono degli incontri nella vita che lasciano il segno per sempre. E questo tu lo dicevi in relazione a Simon Papert, che eh, credo sia stato eh, nella tua, nella nostra storia, nella realtà di cui oggi andiamo a parlare, un maestro per tutti noi, forse a partire da te. Quando hai incontrato Simon Papert? Cosa pensavi di fare a quell'epoca? Cosa ha influenzato la tua vita e soprattutto il tuo lavoro? So, so Seymour Papert did have this profound impact on my life. I first met him, actually almost 20 years before I met you, is in the early 1980s. In 1982, I met Seymour. It was shortly after he published his book, Mindstorms. That came out in 1980, about children, computers, and powerful ideas. And I think when I first met Seymour, I wasn't involved in doing things with education. I'd had a background, I'd studied physics in college, and then I worked as a journalist writing about science and technology. Um, but basically when I met Seymour, it shifted the course of my life because I became so inspired by what he was doing. And if you think back in the year 1982, it was when computers were just first starting to enter the general culture. Personal computers were first sold in the late 1970s, and they started to spread to schools in the early 1980s. Um, and Seymour saw an opportunity that computers could open up new ways for thinking about learning and education. And it was very different than the way most people were thinking about computers then. So computers were, there was a lot of excitement around computers, but for most people, If they thought about computers and learning, they thought the computer will be great for delivering information to the child or giving a quiz to the child and then telling the child whether the child was right or wrong. And those were sort of very straightforward things to do with the computer. And Seymour said, no, that's totally the wrong way of thinking about it. But for a long time, he was a lonely voice. That he said, no, what we need to do is the computer needs to be just another material for the child to create with. The computer should be like the modeling clay and the wooden blocks and the finger paint that we see in the kindergartens of Reggio. The children should use computers to create things and to make things and express themselves. And for me, uh, I was attracted to that partly because I could see the educational value of it, but also because it felt so humane to me. It felt the way we should, that we should treat children. Children should be given the opportunity to explore and express themselves. 
It showed a respect for children. Again, I think aligned with the way that in Reggio, something that, it, that struck me, it's not just providing the opportunities for making things, but to respect for the child. And Seymour had the same thing, you know, thinking about the child in such a respectful way that it was really sort of allowing the children the opportunity to experiment, explore, design, create, uh, and support them in their learning as they went through that experimentation and exploration. And that really resonated with me. So I shifted course in my career uh, and you know, started working with Seymour to try to see how can we help you know, spread those ideas. And actually, one of the first things I started working with him on was working with the Lego company. And we did the com some starting to work on the connecting computers to, to Lego. It was one of the first things we started working on. Um, but I see you as someone that really sort of gave me a new way of thinking about technology. Because before that, I had seen technology as just something very functional. It was good for getting a task done. But again, I hadn't been thinking in terms of education. I knew computers could be very good you know, in a business world for getting a job done. I hadn't seen that computers were something that could give us a new way of thinking about the world and creating things in the world. So he changed the way I thought about computers. He changed the way I thought about learning that I didn't have so much background in it, but the way he talked about it, uh, that learning was you know, something that, we, that, that children are constantly you know, creating their own knowledge through their interaction with the world, made sense to me. It gave me a new vision of what learning was about. And he gave me a new vision of children, again, with this respect for the child. So I really was captivated by that. May I'll mention one more thing about Seymour that we talked about recently. Uh, that not everybody knows about Seymour, uh, but Seymour grew up in South Africa. And as a teenager, he was very active involved in anti-apartheid activity. So Seymour was an activist from an early age. And in fact, he needed to run away from South Africa because he got in trouble with the law. So he needed to escape because of his anti-apartheid activities. So Seymour, from an early age, saw, you know, had a, you know, saw a real purpose in life of trying to you know, change the world for the better, to make things better for everybody, to open opportunities for all people from all backgrounds. Uh, and even though he went on and became, got his PhD in mathematics and philosophy, his heart was always there of trying to bring about real change in the world. So there was a political dimension as well. Uh, so I think that's something else that attracted me towards Seymour, towards Seymour that you know, about wanting to change the world for the better and having a clear sense. And I think also resonates with a lot of the values here in Reggio. Puoi dirmi, mi stai dicendo, ci stai dicendo dunque che questa figura e questo pensiero ha anche influenzato le ragioni per la tua forse invenzione più conosciuta tra le tante, Scratch, perché yeah, hai yeah. iniziato il progetto yeah. di Scratch? Yeah. Quale, perché? Yeah. Per chi? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And actually, let me tell one more story about Seymour and then I'll okay. come to that. Because <laughs> I thought of this the other day as I, and it made it another connection to Reggio. One of Seymour's statements that I liked best was there's a video that has Seymour saying, he says, the purpose of education has very little to do with instruction. It has to do with engagement, of falling in love with the material. Um, and for me, that was really important that, you know, it's not about instruction or information, it's about engagement. And I think that's something else that I saw connecting here. Uh, and it's something that I was just recently rereading the poem, The Hundred Languages, mm. Malaguzzi's poem. And there's a line in there that, you know, that says, that you know, talks about the hundred languages. And it says, uh, the school and the culture tell the child to understand without joy. And I think that also said that Seymour was always pushing against. It was not just about understanding but there had to be a joy, and the joy would lead to the understanding. Uh, it also connects to our work with Lego. I, the, Lego has a saying, the joy of building, the pride of creation. I think another thing that holds us together is this importance of seeing the joy 
is an important part of learning, that engagement, that engagement has to come first. It's not that you learn something and then put it to use. See, we would say, no, you have to become engaged in using things, and through that, you'll learn things. And that's not the way most schools are handled or, or set up. So I think those ideas were ones I always kept with me and, and certainly did influence the way we th I thought about everything that I developed uh, with new technologies and new spaces. And I'll tell a two-part story leading to Scratch, because the first part will come from a, about a space that we created. It was called the Computer Clubhouse. This was something that I created with my long-term colleague and collaborator, Natalie Rusk. Um, and actually, it got started when we were developing some of the Lego technology, and we tried it at a local museum. And Natalie was the director of education at this museum. And during a school vacation week, we brought some of our prototype technology of Lego robotics to the museum for children to try. So while children were on vacation, they came to the museum and they built, you know, you know, different types of, you know, you know, assembly lines and machines and uh, fanciful sculptures. And they clearly enjoyed it and they learned a lot and we learned a lot. So it was a wonderful week. But at the end of the week, we brought the prototypes back to MIT. And the next week, Natalie calls me and says, Children are coming back after school and saying, where's the Lego things? Because they wanted to keep building and creating with these programmable Lego. And the museum wasn't set up for this. Like most museums, it was full of exhibits. And you could spend you know, 15 minutes or half an hour in an exhibit. But it's not something you could spend weeks at. And these children want to keep back working on projects, like the kindergarten children work on the yeah. opera curtains. They wanted to work on projects, and there was nowhere to do that. And we looked around Boston, and we couldn't find places where children could do this. And these children were children from low-income communities, where they were sneaking into the museum because they didn't have money, but they wanted to keep coming and learning. So Natalie and I felt we needed to create a space you know, to, for these children. So actually, we created this computer clubhouse as a space where these children could come and work on projects based on their passions and collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. Um, and it was very much inspired, again, by Seymour's ideas. In Seymour's book, Mindstorms, he has a chapter where he writes about the samba schools of Brazil. And in the samba schools, it's not a typical school where you come in and you get an assignment and then you graduate and go to the next grade. <laughs> the samba schools are where the whole community prepares for carnival. And people of all ages come together to prepare the dances and the floats for carnival. So Seymour was in Brazil, and he visited the samba schools where people of all ages were learning together the dances and the songs. And they were learning with one another and from one another. And he said, this is how all learning should happen. It was a joyful learning. People working on things they cared about in collaboration with others. So that image of the Samba schools that Seymour wrote about was in our minds when we started the clubhouse. It wanted to be a space. It was not a space just for 10-year-olds or just for 12-year-olds, but for a range of ages of children from the community to come together and work on projects together. And the first clubhouse was in Boston. Actually, these are pictures from around the world. There are now 100 clubhouses in 20 countries around the world. From the top left, that's in Mexico. South Africa, United States, and Amman, Jordan. Um, and these have been spaces where children can, again, design, create, experiment, and explore, like the kindergarten children of Reggio. So in some ways, it's trying to, again, take the Reggio idea and bring it to children of all ages. But as we worked with children at the clubhouses, we realized that the children kept asking for certain things that there weren't the right tools available. The children wanted to use computers to create their own interactive stories and games. This was like in the 1990s, where there were a lot of games that were coming out for computers, and children were playing the games, so they wanted to create their own games, but there weren't good tools for children to do that. Certainly, the children coming to the clubhouses were not going to program 
in professional programming languages like C++ or Java. That was beyond them. But actually, the logo programming language that Seymour Papert had developed hadn't really kept up to provide children with access to the, to the media that they wanted to use, to have the animations and songs and speech integrated in. So we saw that children wanted to do it, but the children's programming languages didn't meet their needs. Professional programming languages didn't meet their needs. There was something more that was needed. So that's what led us to develop Scratch. So it really did come from the children asking for it. The children wanted to express themselves you know, through making games and stories and animations. Um, so we started Scratch, and again, guided by those four Ps and the story of the Samba School, we want to make Scratch an online Samba School. Until then, programming languages were just something that you used on your computer. But we want to make it more like a Samba School. So we made Scratch an online community. And when it publicly launched about 10 years ago in 2007, it was not just a programming language, but an online community where children could create projects and then share them with other children around the world. Just in case you haven't seen Scratch, I'll show a brief video that gives you a sense of it. That to, put to, to make a project in Scratch, you snap together graphical blocks, a little bit like Lego bricks, and each stack of blocks controls the behavior of one of the characters in your story or game. There's a game where one fish eats, another, other, eats other fish. But very important, after you make your game or story or animation, you can then click on the share button and you share your project with others around the world. And so there's an audience for what you make. And we you know how important it is when children make something to be able to share it, to get feedback and suggestions and encouragement. And that was important for us in Scratch. And also to get inspiration. The same way that you go into the schools of Reggio and you see examples all over the place. It gives you inspiration. We want children to be able to look online and to get inspiration. Right now, 10 years later, there's 30 million projects that children have shared on the Scratch website. Every day, there's 30,000 new projects that children are sharing. So there's this great library of inspiration where you can go there and see the incredible things that children have done. So for us, it's an inspiration every day because children continue to create things that we never imagined, the same way that children in the schools here continue to create things that you've never imagined, I'm sure. Okay. And uh, I think uh, all schools uh, <laughs> penso che con queste tue uh, dichiarazioni attorno a, a Scratch tu abbia aperto molte curiosità nella nostra audience o domande o, o approfondimenti o critiche rispetto a questo mm. progetto. Però prima di dare la parola a tutti coloro che in sala, e so che sono tanti, vogliono avere una, uno scambio con te, una domanda, le altre le teniamo in serbo. Mm. Eh, nel tuo libro ehm, parli spesso in alcuni passaggi cruciali, di creatività. Cosa, perché hai ripreso in mano questo argomento? Creatività. Perché ne parli? Che senso ha oggi yeah. parlare o parlare di nuovo di creatività? Yeah. Well, I think one reason that I have put a focus on creativity is because I think it is more important in today's world than ever before. And that's because we all can agree that the world is changing very quickly. So we can't know what today's children will need in tomorrow's world. We don't know exactly what skills or exactly what facts or exactly what concepts they'll need. But we do know that they will need to be able to think and act creatively because they will come across new and unknown and uncertain situations because things are changing so quickly. So in order to, to thrive in the world and be happy in the world, they'll need to be able to come up with creative ways of approaching new and uncertain situations. 
And for me, that's what creativity is about. Um, so it feels to me it's so important to, if we, for young people to be able to uh, develop their creative capacities, uh, for them to be able to both succeed in the workplace of the future, but also just in their everyday lives, for the way that they interact with other people, with people in their community, with their friendships, coming up with creative approaches is something that's more important today than ever before. Now, it's not just that, because um, I think that if I were alive 100 years ago, I hope I still would have been arguing for developing creative expression and creative thinking. Uh, because even if the world, when the world wasn't changing so quickly, creative expression and creative thinking brings joy to people. It's joyful when you can create something that people around you appreciate. It brings meaning to life when you can create things that other people around you care. So for me, it's both about joy and meaning, but also being able to navigate the continually changing world that we live in. Um, so in many ways, I think that the core ideas that were, that motivated the first kindergarten 200 years ago and been motivating the Reggio kindergartens and preschool, they were designed specifically because of the needs of 2018. But I do think the ideas of kindergarten were ideal, are ideally suited to the needs of 2018, even if the inventors didn't know that. But I think right now we need kindergarten more than ever because we need creative thinking more than ever. And I think that that kindergarten approach will help children develop as creative thinkers, and that's so important today. Bellissima risposta, ma rubo ancora un momento. Non è che hai parlato di creatività perché temi che il computer possa spegnere creatività o può essere un alleato della creatività? Il computer. Yeah. Well, one way in which maybe that, that, that makes, when we talk about the creativity is more important today than ever before, partly because the world is changing quickly. Another reason is many of the uh, repetitive rote tasks that people did in the past can be done by computers now. And in some ways, it would be, it can be a good thing that many things that you know, weren't as interesting for people to do can be done by computers. And it can free up people to focus more on the creative things, because that's what people are most special at. There are many creative ways. Computers are very, very far away, if ever, from being able to write a poem the way that people do, or to analyze a painting and appreciate a painting the way people do, or to come up with a creative solution to a challenging family problem the way that people can. So what is so special about our humanness is our creativity. So in some ways, that's another reason our creativity is even more important today, that we can focus on that more than before. You know, there's some challenges that come about. As computers take over certain roles, it can be a difficult transition time. So there are definitely problems with it. Uh, but for me, the, we want to make sure that people don't become more like computers. Computers are very good at doing repetitive things. People shouldn't try to do what computers are doing. People should try to do what people are best at doing. And being, creati cre being creative is one of the things that makes us most human. So we should focus on that and make sure that children are growing up being able to develop those creative capacities. Grazie per questa bella risposta. Non voglio più abusare della posizione privilegiata. E quindi invito il pubblico in sala, eh, certamente insegnanti, forse genitori, tutti amici di questi argomenti, a... And we ah. talked about maybe them talking to each other for like three minutes. Ok, yeah. benissimo. Allora forse un'idea che può aiutare, eh, che il professor Resnick propone, è che prima di passare alle domande a lui, voi possiate avere una conversazione, ogni due o tre persone, riflettendo su quanto detto, 
o affinando anche le domande che avevate già dentro di voi perché vi hanno portato qua. Quindi diciamo in stile americano tre minuti, in stile italiano cinque e facciamo, <ride> facciamo una cosa, va bene? Cinque minuti di... va bene? Le... Ok? Thank you. I don't know. How can so, I'm happy so far. You happy so far? Very. Okay. I don't know. How to <laughs> I'm making noise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the photographer take a picture of us, so we should look. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. Very happy, very, okay, very good, happy, yeah. very pleased. Yeah, no, I thought You're so conversation. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wonderful. Yeah. Thanks um, a lot. I don't have to try to do it. No, it just happens no, naturally. Yeah, so. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you a lot, yeah. really. There is a, a beautiful audience, yeah. not only teachers of our school, yeah. but also teachers, maybe parents, maybe others, yeah. people that come. If you have friends, you can involve yeah. them. Yeah, yeah in this discussion and if you want to involve them too. Yeah, no, if they yeah. get up it's fine. So okay. how is that there gonna be microphone oh I see people with okay. microphones. Yes. Okay. Now I have to look at no really it's been very, very, yeah, very yeah. good. That's I'll go talk with Karen and Mike, see if they have Good. Did you have any suggestions? <laughs> One more minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people are going to ask questions. Okay, yeah. No, but if there if are if 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 ideas you think haven't been highlighted, if you think it would be good. Go. Okay. <laughs> For me, it's, it's a lot more fun than most of the book talks I give because it's great talking to Carla. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We run the media lab like a big kindergarten. That, that, that's nice. talking uh, you are completely right uh, they are talking yeah, yeah. talking talking yeah which is nice yeah, yeah that's yeah. nice and uh, yeah, I, I just, yeah yeah it's been hard to get them to stop uh, but three or yeah. five <laughs> they <Yeah>. are three <laughs> ah. one more <coughs> Che 
Demo. Invito. Forse ho distrutto, no. <ride> piano piano invito il pubblico a silenziarsi. È un piacere vedere quanto, quanto scambio c'è, quante cose da dire e da commentare, ma credo che a questo punto è desiderio di tutti conoscere l'oggetto delle vostre discussioni, le domande, le eventuali riflessioni o divergenze, ma soprattutto, avendo noi davanti, direi, una persona di tale esperienza come il professor Resnick e anche come l'autore primo di un programma come Scratch, che è entrato dentro le case di molti di noi e sicuramente dentro a molte delle scuole dei presenti, non dovrebbe essere difficile per il pubblico a questo punto cominciare a proporre domande o riflessioni al professor Resnick. Ci sono due persone a ogni lato dell'auditorium pronte a dare il microfono. Grazie e quindi stiamo aspettando il primo. Ecco, benissimo. Benissimo, se può dire anche... Sì, sì. No, no, il microfono è là. Il microfono, se può camminare anche portarglielo. Ok, prima la... Oh, oh, scusate, sì, le, le signore prima, vero? Se può aiutarci anche, ci dice qualche informazione su di lei? Sì. Yes. Grazie. Um, I teach grade 3 at the International School of Modena. Um, so, um, uh, We, we try to teach according to their children's passions and um, we try to focus on creativity. But um, I have a question for a professor, hello. And um, my question is, as we were brainstorming in um, our little group, uh, my question is, once you have um, a child or many children in front of you and uh, you're trying to give them creative way to learn, to learn and uh, of course you observe them, you listen to them, but how would you suggest that is a good way to, um, uh, to guide the children towards their passions? So, my um, colleague here uh, was telling me, was giving me an example. If you give a child uh, some sticks and some mud, and we're talking about a five-year-old, for example. If you give sticks, mud, is that child going to be interested in architecture or maybe in modeling or maybe in the texture? And so how do you, we guide them to, through to their passions? Thank you. And I think sometimes it seems so easy to say, help them follow their interests or follow their passions. But that's difficult. Most people, they're not even sure what their interests are. Uh, at our computer clubhouses, when children come in, if we just say, what are your interests? They'll say, I don't know. So what we need to do is create a community where children have the opportunity to see lots of possibilities. So in the clubhouses, there's all these different activities going on. And sometimes children, will start out exploring. It's not that they dive right in and say, this is what my long-term passion is, but they see different things. Maybe they'll start on something because of a social connection. A friend has worked on something and they want to join a friend. Or maybe they'll see something complimentary, that they enjoy music and they see someone doing video and they always want to put music and video together. So they say, could they work together on that? Or somebody is doing something that they've never tried before but looks interesting to them 
and they'll go over and start to work with that. So I think we want to make sure that children have the opportunities to start to explore and not expect that they're going to find right away, but to be able to move through a space where they try different things, but when they have something that they get interested in, they have the opportunity and the time to go deep with it. So that's what we try to do. It's not, there's no easy recipe or easy formula for it, but it's about creating a community space where people see lots of options, lots of possibilities, and then support as they get started. And support is also important that sometimes people see, they view education and learning too much in terms of these extremes of freedom and structure. And when we see, when we say that children should follow their passions, sometimes people think we mean you need to stand back and let them do whatever they want. And that's not what we mean. Because you need structure to be able to follow your interests. So the children might see something they're interested in, but if there's no support and they have trouble, they'll then lose interest and go elsewhere. So we need to provide support to allow children to, to do it. We sometimes say we need to give children the freedom to follow their fantasy, but enough support so they can make their fantasy come true. C'era un altro signore? Grazie. Sì, eccomi. E dunque, innanzitutto, buonasera, io insegno a dei ragazzini di prima media, quindi sono un pochettino più grandicelli, 11 anni. E, mh, eh, lo dico per dire che una cosa che a me interessa molto è fargli utilizzare uno smartphone per eh, imparare delle cose. E conosco Scratch eh, da molti anni e eh, una cosa che mi ha molto colpito di quello che ha detto è il sipario e il compito di realtà, che è una cosa che secondo me è assolutamente indispensabile nella scuola moderna. Io mi immagino una scuola che alla quale partecipo un po' sperimentando che si chiama scuola nel bosco io insegno in una scuola normale poi nel mio giorno libero vado nel bosco insieme a degli altri bambini perché è una cosa che mi sembra importante e mi piacerebbe eh, avere uno strumento che mi permetta di utilizzare in un modo intelligente un dispositivo mobile perché è lì che il compito diventa reale faccio velocissimamente un esempio andiamo dal ciclista, il ciclista ripara le biciclette il mio gruppo di cinque bambini comincia a fare delle foto, raccoglie, combina all'interno di un linguaggio di programmazione qualcosa che possa risolvere un problema che viene proposto realmente l'ho fatto alcune volte e questa cosa è vero quando le, i compiti diventano reali l'apprendimento accompagnato chiaramente dalla gioia, dalla scoperta e tutto quanto diventa reale e veramente significativo per loro e, come pensa possa essere il futuro di Scratch rispetto a una prospettiva di questo genere? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good question and it is very much aligned with where we're trying to head with Scratch. Um, in the 10 years that Scratch has been around, we got launched in 2007 and we had a second generation in 2013 And this summer, in August, we will launch, launch the third generation of Scratch. And there are two new things with the third generation of Scratch that will start to address the issues that you raised. It will still take more time to continue to develop them, but we'll getting started on two ways. First is to be much more, to work much better on mobile devices. Since Scratch was designed a while ago, it was not well designed for mobile devices. The new version of Scratch this summer, Scratch 3.0, is designed with mobile devices in mind. Right from the beginning, it will be easy to create Scratch projects on tablets, and you can at least view Scratch projects on your phone. We still are working on being able to author projects on your phone, but we now have an infrastructure that will let us move in that direction. So we're designing Scratch to work better on mobile devices. The second thing we're doing is to make Scratch more of a hub that connects to other things in the world. Most of the things on Scratch right now are just projects that run as images on the screen. Uh, that's what most Scratch projects are. But we know there's so much potential for connecting to the world. You now we're already experimenting with that. Here at Regio, we have a wonderful collaboration on a project called Light Play, where a version of Scratch is being used to control lights that children can turn to different colors 
to cast shadows and to make motors turn. Um, and I think that is pointing in a direction for the future. So that's an experiment we're doing now. And with the new version of Scratch, we'll make it much easier to do more things like that, of having Scratch connect to things in the physical world, connect to sensors to get input from the world, to connect to the online world to get data online. I should be able to make a Scratch project that has a weather map that pulls in data from, a, from some source online to make it into my weather map. You cannot do that today. So the new version of Scratch is much better set up to connect to the physical world with motors and lights and sensors and to connect to the online world. And I th our hope is that that will enable Scratch to be used for even more meaningful things that connect to people in their everyday lives. So we're working on it. So try out the new version in August. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll continue to move in that direction. So, abbiamo già un, uno schizzo di futuro prossimo che vuole andare in questa direzione, ma sono certa che ci sono altri che vincono il timore del microfono per eh, condividere, ripeto, il tema della discussione, dello scambio che si è avuto è, è molto bello perché ognuno sta guardando l'altro ci vuole eh, quello che ha ah, eh, eh, grazie Giusy no, grazie a te Carla che ci hai portato Resnik è no, sempre no. un regalo grandissimo poter essere qui viene ad ascoltarlo per, viene per, per te beh, mica per solo te. per me, l'ho <ride> ordinato io è arrivato con Amazon <ride> direttamente insieme al libro <ride> Mi è piaciuto molto quello che ha scritto in questo libro. C'è la creatività, c'è lo slancio, la forza per noi insegnanti per accompagnare Scratch insieme ai nostri bambini, verso i nostri bambini. Mi manca un pezzo. All'inizio, alla presentazione di Scratch, si parlava moltissimo dell'importanza del pensiero computazionale nel utilizzare Scratch, nel progettare. Ora vedo che c'è la parte della creatività fortemente sostenuta in questo libro. Mi chiedo, quel pensiero computazionale, che è la forza che ci sostiene nel processo con i bambini, è forse diventata quella struttura di cui parlava prima, quella struttura che sostiene la creatività e che fa rete tra tutti noi, dico utilizzatori di Scratch e ammiratori eh, di quello che sta succedendo al MIT di Boston e che di conseguenza ricade anche su di noi. Fermo qui la mia domanda. Grazie. Uh, I think you mentioned in your question the idea of computational thinking. Yeah. And many people today are talking about the importance of computational thinking. But people use it in different ways. One thing that I worry about is that some people think about it too narrowly. They, they think it's just about learning specific computational concepts, like learning about iteration and learning about conditionals. Uh, and those can be valuable things to learn. And it's useful to learn those concepts, but I worry that it can be too narrow. It's only one thing that we want to do. We want to look at computational thinking and the ideas of Scratch much more broadly. I sometimes talk about it that we have three goals with Scratch. Do we want to help children develop their thinking, develop their voice, and develop their identity? So let me say a little bit about each of those. Because develop their thinking is part of what you're referring to. And I do see that as important. It's one element, and it is important. Uh, because I think it does open up programming and scratch, provides new ways for children to develop as more systematic thinkers and to think, uh, to understand how to solve certain types of problems and develop new problem-solving strategies. And that's very valuable and useful. Sometimes 
I don't talk about that as much because that's what lots of people are talking about. But it's, it is important, but it's not the only thing. In addition to developing your thinking, it's also important to develop your voice. And what I mean by developing your voice is being able to share your ideas with the world, to be able to express your ideas. And this way, I see I want to make Scratch similar to learning how to write. When you learn how to write, it's powerful because you're able to share your ideas with other people, whether it's writing a love letter to a friend or a thank you note to someone who gave you a gift or writing uh, a letter to the, to the city council who's implementing a law that you disagree with. You can share your ideas on a personal level and a community level. So developing your voice, and I think with Scratch, you can see it as an extended form of writing. It gives you a new way of communicating your ideas, a more dynamic, interactive way. Now, writing is still valuable and important, but Scratch gives you a new way of, of developing your voice so you can share your ideas with more people. And then the third part of developing your identity. And for that, I mean, I want to have children grow up feeling that they are full, active members of today's society, that they're full citizens. So they see themselves as active contributors, as part of their identity. Um, and I think the way this is related to the way uh, some of the great literacy movements of the world have been motivated. People like Paulo Freire, with his great literacy movement in Brazil, Freire did not just want people to learn to read and write so they could get jobs, although that was important. He wanted them to learn to read and write so they felt like full citizens. So you couldn't feel like you're a full citizen if you don't know how to read and write, to be a full member of society. And I feel the same thing with coding, that I want children to grow up feeling that, you know, that they are full and active contributors. Uh, the computer has a special role in our society, and I don't want children seeing the computer as something that just gives them information or that it does the job. I want them to feel that they can use the computer to, to create things, to share things, uh, and, and that they are a full and active contributor in that way. So to your question, yes, I agree. Even in the narrow view of computational thinking has some role, but I want to expand it to make sure that we see it more broadly. And with Scratch, we're always thinking how we can not just develop children's thinking, but help them develop their voice and develop their identity. Un altro argomento molto importante, benissimo. Hi, I'm Valentina Chimici, and I work at Arduino. Uh, so since you were mentioning the fact that you want to include uh, more the physical experience within Scratch, uh, some, some people s mostly argue about the fact that Scratch doesn't allow the children to have a smooth transition from the visual and the textual based um, kind of coding. So w what's your suggestion uh, about like this kind of transition and how can we make this kind of ex experience more inclusive for those who yeah. start from a visual uh, based uh, coding language yeah. and transition to a more yeah. complex one? Well, I do think there is some value of being able to facilitate an easy transition from a graphical language like Scratch to a more professional language. And in fact, just the design of Scratch already makes it pretty well suited for that, that Scratch really is like a text language, but just putting on blocks. It gets rid of some of the, the syntax, the punctuation of traditional languages. But we have found that children who do start with Scratch and move on to traditional languages generally have a fairly smooth transition. We haven't focused so much on that, though, because we don't see our primary focus is, to, is on children who, are, who will be making that transition. I think for many, many children in the world, a graphical language will serve all the needs that they have. Certainly, if you want to ever get a job as a professional programmer, you need to go through that transition. But most children will not become professional programmers. So 
I'd rather, uh, we put more emphasis on saying, how can we let Scratch serve the needs of 90% of the people who will be fine with just graphical languages? And we try to make a good transition for the other 10% or whatever, uh, but it's not our top priority. Some people do make it a higher priority to be able to support making that transition. And I have nothing against that, but it's not something that we've made a high priority. Did that make sense? Okay. Bene, qualcun altro in, uh, nella sala? Credo che gli argomenti siano andati bene, ok? Crescendo, lievitando davanti a noi. Um, buonasera, mi chiamo Augusto Chioccariello, lavoro al Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche. Nel libro di Resnick eh, mi è piaciuta molto la citazione che lui fa di Reggio Emilia e soprattutto di una poesia di Malaguzzi, Cento linguaggi dei bambini, in cui c'è questa affermazione che lui citava prima che la scuola, in genere il sistema educativo come lo conosciamo, non ne, se ne ruba 99. E credo che questa sensazione non sia scomparsa in molti sistemi educativi. Cosa è il suo punto di vista nel muoversi verso questo obiettivo che non credo sia tanto ideale e che abbia bisogno di cambiare completamente il mondo? Ci sono molti esempi in cui il sistema educativo approccia questa affermazione di Di Malaguzzi. C'è possibilità? Bisogna avere speranza? In che modo vede il suo lavoro, Scratch, ehm, il suo libro sulla creatività, che possa muoversi in questa direzione? It's true that our bigger goal is not just to get a programming language out to the world, but to change the world and to help people have new opportunities in their lives. And I sometimes describe myself as a short-term pessimist, but long-term optimist. <laughs> and I'm a short-term pessimist because I know how difficult it is to bring about change. Uh, especially in the world of education and learning. Uh, it's very difficult to bring about change because it's difficult to change systems and to change mindsets. Educational systems are set up where there's many different inter interlocking parts and it's hard to change one part without changing the other. So educational systems resist change. They're set up for purposes of, of efficiency and other purposes that they're well suited for, but it makes it difficult to change a system. It's also difficult to change mindsets, the way people think about things. That if people have grown up with a certain approach to education, where information was delivered to them, and instruction was delivered to them, they're accustomed to that, and it's difficult to get them to shift the way they think about things. So that's why it's not easy to bring about change in the short term. But I'm optimistic for the long term because I see the trends in the culture are moving in the right, right direction. The types of approaches here at Reggio and the type of approaches I talk in my book with projects, passion, peers, and play will help lead to creative thinking. And the need for creative thinking will become more and more recognized over time. Because the world will keep changing more quickly. And I'm convinced that there that more people will recognize the need for creative thinking. And we start to see hints of this. We do see more examples of schools and museums that are embracing a, a change and new approaches. We see movements like the maker movement, uh, where it's embracing the idea of children as creators and makers. Now, all of these movements need to be improved and refined to make the progress that we want. But there are the beginning signs. Uh, and I think it will continue to change because the need for a change will be there. And even if people aren't embracing all of these ideas yet, people do are, inc the, almost everyone recognizes the need for change. They realize that something is not working. So that gives me optimism. But maybe the thing that gives me the most optimism is the young people. But as young people grow up today with more opportunities to be part of a scratch community, 
or to go to places like computer clubhouses, even if it's still just small numbers now, those numbers will grow, and those children will grow up to become agents of change. They won't be willing to accept things the way they are. They'll be wanting things to be different. So I do think there'll be a next generation and then a next generation. And we need to be patient. It won't happen automatic. It won't happen in the near term uh, all at once, I don't think. But I believe that it will continue to change as long as we keep working on it. It's something we all have to work on together. It won't happen automatically. But if we all act together to try to spread the Reggio approach, the lifelong kindergarten approach, I think as we grow and grow, it will influence more and more people, and the change will come about. So I feel confident that that will happen in the long term. And there are many ways of doing it. I think things like Scratch can help children you know, get some new ideas of what approaches to learning that will influence them, will influence teachers. We're also trying to mobilize and connect educators who share these ideas, because a lot of times, Educators feel very lonely if they feel these things, but the people around them don't support it, or the administration of their school doesn't support it. They feel very lonely. We need to find more ways to help educators connect with others who share the same values and the same vision. So there are a number of ways that we're doing this. Like our colleagues at the Exploratorium have a wonderful online course that's called the, it's called the Art of Tinkering, or it's Tinkering Fundamentals. It's about tinkering. So it's taking the approaches that they have you know, ex developed at the Exploratorium, but making it, it's not, it's making it available to people around the world, but even more important, connecting to people who can then share ideas with one another. We're trying a similar thing at the Media Lab. We have an online course and community called Learning Creative Learning. Actually, if you can switch the projector to go back to my computer, uh, this is an online course and community it's called Learning Creative Learning, where, and there's some members of the, online, of the Learning Creative Learning community are here today. I know some members who came from Rome just for today because they were active participants in our Learning Creative Learning community. And this is a place where people with shared interests come together. We share our ideas from the Media Lab, but they share their ideas. Carmelo from our group uh, is, is really taking the lead of helping to put together that community. And we're working hard to make sure it's not just a course where it delivers information and you're finished, but we're trying to figure out how to make it an online community. It's not easy. There's still a lot that we have to learn. And it's not just online. What's most exciting is when people participate in it, but then they have real-time in-person meetings. So we've seen around the world local gatherings of learning, creative learning, where people get together and share their ideas and then share it back online. So we're trying to do that. So Actually, if you have more, well, you, there's a website there. It's lcllearningcreativelearning.media.mit.edu. You could check that out or talk to Carmelo afterwards, or Adriana, who's here, who's been an active member from the community, who lives in Rome, is here, and there are others from the community you could come and talk to as well. But we need more things like that. It's not that any one of these communities is the answer. But we need more ways just to connect together people who share the ideas the same way that we've worked together for 20 years and have helped support and share ideas and made each other stronger, we need to find more ways of people who share these ideas to connect and make one another stronger. C'è questa ondata di ottimismo che credo difficile da avere, ma coraggiosamente proposta alla nostra sala. Io, eh, ecco, c'è una domanda. Eh, se, No, no, veloce, un commento, era solo per concordare se dopo la sua i nostri partner di ricerca hanno voglia di lasciarci un commento, non solo della giornata, ma proprio della ricerca stessa che stiamo facendo, per poi su queste parole del professor Resnick, dopo l'ultima domanda, poterci eh, lasciare. Prego. Sì, io sono Adriano Parracciani, mi occupo di laboratori extrascolastici dove integriamo robotica, programmazione, tinkering, making e design. Ora Mitch, nel tuo libro eh, parli delle 4P a fondamento del creative learning. Eh, una delle P è play. Play è forse la parola più fraintesa in assoluto, sicuramente in inglese 
ancora di più in italiano dove play gioco significa tendenzialmente divertirsi se non perdere tempo eh, mi ha colpito tantissimo anche emozionato il tuo racconto alla visita eh, nella casa di Anna Frank dove forse eh, appunto hai, hai colto invece una delle essenze de del concetto di play che metti nel libro io lì ho capito ancora di più quello che avevo già capito ecco se tu potessi spendere e condividere con noi que quella riflessione sul concetto di play che è tanto difficile da capire in Italia soprattutto nel mondo della scuola grazie Adriano is meant, referring to a section of my book where I talk about a number of years ago I was at a conference in Amsterdam and it was a conference about play and the conference was full of the latest of video games and different types of you know, virtual reality and it's what many people think of today when they think of play of this type of you know, sophisticated interaction with computers and after I made my presentation at this conference uh, I thought that I wanted to spend some time away from the conference and just not so far away was the Anne Frank house um, and I wanted to go visit. <laughs> But I have trouble telling the story. Credo che basti che questa tua emozione per dire il ruolo profondo che sappiamo che attribuisci alla parola play come una parola di libertà e di vita quindi eh, credo che ti ringraziamo anche solo per la tua emozione ok? grazie e credo che che sarebbe bello ora dare eh, la parola, se la vogliono, ai nostri partner di ricerca, nel senso che Esploratorium, Lego, così, un commento all'incontro, eh, eh, Reggio Emilia, alle scuole in Ile, tutti i soggetti che sono coinvolti, se vogliono avere, direi, eh, l'ultimo commento, l'ultima parola, non solo di, di questo pomeriggio, ma di giornate, di una bellezza gioiosa, giocosa, proprio perché è anche difficile ed emozionante. Mm? Qualcuno vuole iniziare? Amos, and, uh, Amos Blanton, yes. Lego Foundation. Mi chiamo Amos Blanton, from the Lego Foundation. Sono um, glad you gave me the opportunity, Carla, to come up here and just say uh, how fantastic it was spending these past few days, but also. Uh, this past year of collaborations have been amazing. And, uh, and I think that even though each of these partners have different contexts, uh, one a museum, uh, another one school system here in Italy, and then Lego with a different context as well, we all share this core value around play, this love of seeing children play and engage and learn through that process. And it's so clear whenever we see each other's work, uh, it's really inspiring. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful honor to be part of this collaboration. Grazie, grazie Emma. And I'm Mike Petrich from the Exploratorium and want to thank both you, Mitchell, for our long-term relationship and friendship and, and your mentorship for us and Carla, your, our burgeoning relationship and your mentorship for us. One of the um, very important parts that I'll take away from our time together is not just the impact and, and effort that we want to make toward supporting children to be learners, but to support ourselves, the colleagues, the adults who are in the room, who I think have to have a disposition where we're playful and where we're engaged and where we're curious. And we see ourselves as co-learners, not just the educators with all the knowledge who will playfully embed some ideas in the children. And so I think that's best exemplified through our partnership in Reggio, at the Media Lab, at LEGO, and hopefully anyone else who's willing to participate in that larger network to continue to be playful with that disposition and keep tinkering lifelong. Grazie.
Io credo, se nessuno degli altri partner reggiani vuole intervenire, con queste parole possiamo chiudere questo pomeriggio generoso di riflessioni, credo di presenza, ringraziando tutti voi, coloro che vengono da più lontano, grazie davvero, coloro che pure vicini hanno trovato il tempo di un pomeriggio che ci ha dato attraverso il discorso del <coughs> linguaggio computazionale, del computer, di Scratch, l'occasione di disegnare gli orizzonti futuri di un'umanità dove noi, che non sappiamo quale sarà, ma con cui noi vogliamo andare per dare quelle qualità, quei colori che il gioco, la vita, può e deve offrire a noi e ai nostri bambini. Quindi vi prego di eh, ringraziare con tutto l'applauso che merita la sua generosità il professor Resnick. Buona serata a tutti e grazie alle nostre interpreti come sempre. Grazie. You were the one before. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for organizing and for being a wonderful conversation.